My name is Henry Friedman. I was born in 1928 in a city called Brody. At that time, it was Poland. Brody today is part of independent Ukraine. At the present time, I'm lucky to live part-time in California in Palm Desert. And most of the time, I live in the beautiful state of Washington. In the Polish school, in the public schools, which I used to go to, uh, they had religious classes. And uh, like an hour during the week, I don't remember exactly, but I remember as Jewish kids, we would be outside and we would be playing soccer, something like this, or ball. And I never forgotten it. The kids came out one time and yelled at me, at us, Jesus killers, just wait until Hitler comes. And one of them kicked the ball outside, you know, and so forth, he was very angry. And as a kid at that time, that's the first time I've heard of Hitler. My father was a very generous person. Uh, especially, we used to get many beggars. They would come to the house and knock. And especially on Friday night before Sabbath, my father would invite them to stay with us for the Sabbath. And they would tell us stories about Hitler, Germany, Nazi Germany, that they escaped from, came to Poland, but they were poor, so they would go and ask for help. And I remember when they would leave, my father, my mother would say to my father, ah, the Germans cannot be that bad. They are, these are people of cultura. They are cultured people. Uh, something like this, only the Russians. Uh, they're the barbarians because of the experience that they have had in the First World War with the Russians. So that's when I, as a kid, have had the first experience or he hear about Hitler or anything like that. The part of Ukraine that I was living in 1939, as history tells us Stalin made a pact with Hitler to divide Poland and the part that I was living in the Ukraine Western Ukraine was taken over by Russians so between 1939 and 1941 we were on the Russian occupation uh, we had a textile store in the city of Brody but under communism, you couldn't own any private enterprise. So our property was taken away uh, by the Russians and they made it into a cooperative, they call it, store. And uh, so my father took the family to our farm because we had a farm outside the city, maybe six miles, 10 kilometers, something like that. And uh, so it was, uh, a different lifestyle, especially for my family, my mother especially, because we didn't have a out, we didn't have a regular bathroom running water inside the house on the farm. We didn't have any electricity on the farm, so we had to use the outhouse. But as a kid, I used to go in the summertime to the farm, so it was no big deal for me. And the Russians treated kids very well in school and I was a good student so I had no problem with that. I would say my first shock of a war was in September of 1939 where we were woken up 
by bombs falling on my city of Brody. And my father took us down to a basement where we used to keep coal for heating. And it had a terrible smell, a burnt type smell. And uh, I didn't like it, obviously. And with every bomb that fell, our ground shook, the whole house shook. And I wasn't afraid that something would happen to me because, you know, as a kid, you feel your parents will protect you. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. So, I mean, I didn't think of that. I was really angry. I wanted to be outside to see what was going on. And finally, one daylight came and the bomb stopped falling. And I went out and I saw my city burning. Fires were still burning. But what I saw across the street, not far, there was a horse laying down. And he must have had a bullet or shrapnel or something in his stomach. And the blood was kind of bubbling. And I just stopped there, I was memorized by it. And I remember my mother came over, put her hand over my eyes, pulled me by the hand, pulled me away. But I never forgot that sight because that horse has huge eyes. They were just looking at me. And that was the most frightening thing that I remember as a kid. My first experience was wars are all about. In 19, in June of 1941, Nazi Germany attacked, at that time, the Soviet Union. And within a short time, Nazi Germany occupied the city of Brody. And the first order was that all Jews, especially professionals and non-Jews, had to register in order to work. The Jewish intelligentsia that went and registered, none of them were ever released. 250 were shot that week, and the rest were taken away to concentration camps, which never to be heard from again. I would say in a, maybe after a month of occupation, a truck with two German soldiers and an officer pulls up in front of our house, and they start taking some of our possessions. And they were happy, they had enough. And we had a porch right outside our house. And my mother was, got out, and the officer's about to get into the truck. My mother was crying, holding her hands, like I visualize today, like this. And he noticed a wedding ring on my mother's finger. And he was coming back, and my mother ran inside the house, and I'm following her. And then I noticed he's trying to take the wedding ring off her finger. And she's screaming, because she was in pain. Wedding ring has been on her finger all these years. So I stopped between the officer and my mother, tried to push him away. And I've never forgotten, he slapped me in the face, knocked me to the ground. And I remember that my father used to have a pistol before the war. I went looking for that pistol. Luckily for me, I never found it. About a month, and within the month, an order came out that all Jewish people from the age of six years old will have to wear armbands to identify them as Jews. And just to give you an example of what happened if you were caught without your identity as a Jew, my mother and my cousin went to the city of Brody and they were afraid to have the identity because there was no law to protect a Jew. And uh, 
So they hid their identity. They took their arm. They didn't have their armbands on. And somehow they were recognized by the police or somebody squealed on them, pointing them out as Jews. My mother was severely beaten on her upper arms. She couldn't lift them for a month. But my cousin, who was at that time maybe 14, 15 years old, they made her empty out outhouse with her bare hands. And she was throwing up for weeks and weeks. Uh, couldn't hold any food down. And this was, you know, one of the punishments for not having your identity as a Jew. And this is how brutal. Uh, these, this, were, this was done not by the Germans. This was done by the Ukraine police at that time. This is, this is something that I could never understand. I couldn't understand why kids that I went to school with, and especially there was one young man, he was two years older than me. He was failing in math. And under the Russian system, if you did not have the grades, you couldn't step into the next grade. You had to know the work of that grade. And I helped this kid uh, <clears throat> to, because I was good in math. I was a good student. Uh, it came easy to me. I mean, not that I was that brainy, but it, it came easier to me than to others. And so I helped him. I used to share sandwiches with a kid. When the Nazis came, he and a bunch of guys were out later on to find us and kill us. Now, I, I never did anything to the guy. I was hunted worse than an animal. This is something that I could never understand, and I don't understand, even to this day, after all these years, how can human beings behave that way? And uh, I've never overcome that. Uh, I have a problem with that. The most painful thing that I used to see is some of my uncles working on the road, breaking rocks with those heavy hammers. And I, could, I would see them, and I couldn't do anything about it because I didn't want to give myself away. But I would, they would catch my eyes, I would catch their eyes. And at times I would see Germans, but they were guarded by Ukraine police, not Germans. I would see sometimes Germans having fun because Jewish people, especially religious people, used to have beards. And they would cat, catch a Jew uh, with a beard. And I witnessed that one time. And uh, they were beating him, and not much I could do about it uh, as a kid because I was too young at that time. My father felt that once they have us behind barbed wires, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to get out. So he went to this manager, I forgot his name right now, I don't remember his name, and he said, look, I know what to plant in the land, in the parcel land that we own, because if you plant today potatoes in a parcel on this plot, you have to plant something else next year because potatoes take a lot out of the soil. And he said, let me help you with the planting and harvesting. Plenty of time for us to go into the ghetto. And the guy thought that was a good idea. What could he lose? He went to the Gestapo and got the special permission to stay outside the ghetto. And uh, finally, uh, when we had to go in, in October, that was in 1942. In October, when we had to go into the ghetto, he told us that the Germans were coming, or the police were coming to escort us into the ghetto of Brody. And that's the time where we disappeared. 
from existence as far as the Germans were concerned. Because that gave my dad time to prepare our hideaway places. The people that took us in were Christians. They had a house, it was like half was the quarters where they were living, and the other half, they had animals. We were put above the animals, up in the loft. Our space was about the size of a queen-size bed. My mother and the teacher had their hats one way, myself and my brother the opposite, so our feet kind of etched in in between. All we could do in that space is either lay down or sit up. There was not enough room for me or my mother or my, the teacher to stand up. My younger brother could. But when we found ourselves in the morning in the space, complete darkness, because we were surrounded by hay. But we were right at the end of that building, and there was a plywood boards in front of us, and they had cracks in between, and finally we got used to the darkness and the little light that came, and I noticed that there was a nut in the wood paneling, and I started working on it, and after a few days, I got an opening to the outside the size of a silver dollar. And let me tell you, this was like a floodlight coming into our area. It gave us that much light. But when I crawled up and I looked into the village, we were up on a hill so I could see into the village near a road. And I saw kids playing football, laughing, screaming. And here I was, stuck with two females and a kid brother. Let me tell you, I was strong as a horse because I worked on a farm. We had plenty of food at that time. I wasn't a very happy camper. And I was also spoiled as a kid, a very finicky eater. The lady would bring us a pot of soup, and a piece of bread, one in the morning, once in the morning, and once at night. But she would put boiled onions into the soup to give it a little taste. And I hated the taste of boiled onions. So I just wouldn't eat it. But let me tell you, after three months in this place, we were cut down to one meal. Because the people that took us in, they were not rich. They were poor people. My father prepared food for six months, gave them enough food. They shared the food, so after three months, they cut us down to one meal. And the one meal would be a pot of soup again and a piece of bread, but that would be sent up to us at night. So what we would do is put a little pot between our bodies and keep it warm so we could eat it the next morning. The lady never had to wash the pot because I had the privilege to lick every little drop of food that was still left on it. Because by that time, I was so, so hungry. I don't know, I can never explain to anyone what it is to be so, so hungry. That your mind and everything is constantly thinking of food. What we heard about the Nazis, yes, we heard about brutality. 
But we didn't know about death camps. We knew people were dying. We knew how brutal the Germans were. They were because they killed 250 uh, in the first week, right? Uh, in Brody, uh, they were killed, they were taken out and murdered. And we knew what they were doing in other cities. They would make them dig out. Uh, there's a town called Zlotchev, which my cousin was buried alive when they had machine guns all lined up. And uh, they were supposed to dig trenches to bury Russian dead soldiers and animals and so forth. Instead, they had machine guns hidden and they killed people. My cousin threw herself in alive. Later on, she dug herself out. So we knew those kind of brutality. But we, when we went in to hiding, we did not know about dead camps like gas chambers and those things. The only time we found out was after. The Nazis were very good in hiding these things because when they took Jews during Oxion, they were just supposedly resettling them to other places and putting them to work. So the secret was very well kept. And most people didn't believe, didn't want to believe uh, the worst parts because they always felt that people were exaggerating. And very few people, uh, we know some people that jumped off the trains when they were taken, and they would come and tell us stories. People still had a difficult time believing it. The worst part was, it's almost the day before liberation. Uh, we didn't get any food for about two days. And the Germans had a fuel kitchen. And we could smell the aroma of the food that came from the yard, in the front yard, the uh, house where we were hiding. But we were starving. And then we saw Finally, we saw the Germans running for their lives. We saw Russia, and we, from my little peak hole, Russia chasing the Germans. And there was like, all of a sudden, the Germans were not 10 foot tall. They were human, they were scared like everybody else would be. But then we started hearing German voices from below. And we said, oh my God. Tomorrow, the Germans are going to be back. They're going to be searching every dwelling. Why did we lower ourselves, identify ourselves to the Russians? This was probably the longest night of my life because I thought that this was my last night, really. And in the morning, when morning came, we saw Russians all over, but we were like numb. We were still up there. And T, uh, Mary Simchuk, which was the lady that took care of us, our angel, started yelling, please come down. The Russians are going to kill Ivan. What happened? The German voices that we heard from below were two German soldiers hiding from the Russians, where we were hiding from them upstairs. And Ivan, uh, Mr. Simchuk, was accused of hiding German soldiers, and it was punishable by that. So when we came down, and they took one look at us, the Russians, they couldn't believe what they saw. I had long hair. I was a skeleton. My skin was hanging loose. I didn't have any meat on me. And our bodies were all pit marks from lice and fleas. The first thing they made us do is take our clothes off and burn the clothes and give us some clothes to put on because we never washed ourselves. 
18 months that we were in that space, we never washed ourselves. We never changed the clothing that we slept in. And they put some DDT powder over us. Uh, but there wasn't long celebration because German airplanes start bombing that area. And <clears throat> my father found a horse in a sled and took us about 40 miles or 40 kilometers behind the lines. I could not walk because my muscles were all atrophied. Either could my brother walk. But for the 18 months that I was in that space, I never got sick. None of us ever got sick. We didn't even cough. Because if we would have coughed, it would have been the end for us. Yet two weeks after liberation, I got sick of typhus. And people were dying all over. But luckily for me, my mother found a Jewish Russian doctor in the military, and he put me in a military hospital. And uh, that saved my life. And as a matter of fact, because afterwards, afterwards, all of us, my brother got sick of typhus, everybody else got sick of typhus, they were all put in that military hospital. And uh, I didn't know because you have high temperature what was going on. The most difficult time that I had is to learn how to walk again. That was the most painful thing. But these guys were expertise because they had to send the soldiers right back into the front. So uh, it was... Uh, as painful as it was, the most painful thing for me was in June of 1944, when we finally came to Brody because Brody was liberated. There was hardly any building standing in Brody because the front line stopped there for three months. Brody had, prior to the war, between the surrounding areas, about 15,000 Jews. When we came to Brody, and by the time some of the Jews came back, we were less than 100 of us that survived. The only one that survived in the whole city as a family was my father, my mother, and my younger brother and me. Most of them were sister and brother, there was only one older boy, about two, three years older than me, that survived with his father. Otherwise, none of my relatives, except for a cousin that was a, lived about 40 kilometers from the area that I was, she was hidden by a priest, wife, priest's wife. She did not tell her husband, the priest, that she was hiding my cousin. So she was the only one that survived from both sides of the family, on my father's side or my mother's side. Right after liberation, I was numb, so to speak. It's like, uh, you know, you go to a dentist and he puts in Novocaine and you, f you can touch it, you might but you, you don't feel it. And this is the way it was. It took many, many years for me personally, even to think about it. I was, uh, personally, I was almost suicidal, you may say. Uh, I just lived for today. It took me many, many years even to think about it or talk about it. When I married my wife, she was American born. She never knew, she knew I was from Europe, but she never knew what I went through. And after we were married, I used to get nightmares. And she would 
wake me up. He said, you're dreaming. What is it all about? Oh, I said, you wouldn't understand. And that was my answer. You wouldn't understand. One time, she wouldn't let me go back to sleep. We were on a trip. I was a salesman, so I took her with me in a small town about one o'clock in the morning when I had my nightmare. And that was the first time that I told her about my experience. And we both cried. And that was the end of it. And when I had children, they would come home from school and ask me questions about what they may have learned about the Holocaust. And all I could say is yes or no. Never go into details. About the 1960s, my youngest son, for my birthday, bought me a tape recorder. He said, Dad, I know it's hard to you to talk about that period. But we really want to know. When you feel like it, would you please tell us? Because they used to hear my nightmare screaming at night, and because I wouldn't talk about it to them. So in the 1960s, I started dictating some of my thoughts, some of my experiences into the state. It was much easier to talk to a machine than to talk to my children because I didn't cause them any pain. But in 1983, I went to Washington, D.C. for a gathering of Holocaust survivors. And I read an article in the paper that some of the uh, deniers, Holocaust deniers, stated that the Holocaust never happened. And it was all a lie, it was uh, all made up. And I thought to myself and I said to my wife, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen. What happened to all my relatives? Where are they? How come there's no tombstones for any of them any place? And at that time, we. The group, some of the leadership decided to build a Holocaust museum in Washington, D.C. And on the plane back, I said to my wife, you know, Washington, D.C. is 3,000 miles away from Seattle. Why don't we do something in Seattle like that? Because it is very, very important. But after all the documents that are available on the Holocaust, that just recently, this is year 2007, you had a country called Iran. The president invited Holocaust deniers to his country, and they're trying to change, rewrite history, factual things. So if we do not teach in this, in this time of our life, we are the eyewitnesses and tell the truth. And the only reason we tell the truth as it is as painful as it is for us to tell that truth is because we don't want things like this to happen to any people. Unfortunately, today, genocide is still happening. You have a country like in Darfur, in, uh, in the Saudis, uh, a place called Durfur, D-U-R-F-U-R, where hundreds of people are being murdered. You have, and nobody's doing anything. United Nations is talking about it. America is talking about it, but still the people are being killed. You have seen what happened in Uganda, where 
ethnic group of people were killing each other. You saw what happened in Cambodia. You see, history has a way of repeating itself. And this is the reason that I feel we Holocaust survivors, what we are doing is so commendable. We are not asking for revenge. We are not asking for anything. All we are doing is to say thank you, America, which was so helpful to the Jews in many other places and all the world what we are saying. Each one of us is different. Each one of us is special, no matter what color we have, what religion we believe in. But each one of us can make a difference. When a young lady her name was Julia Simchuk, 17 and a half years old, would not have warned my father to run for his life from the Nazis. We, I wouldn't be here, we would not have survived. One person made that difference. The Simchuk family and the Bozelchik family made a difference by saving our lives. So it doesn't take lots of people. And the reason what we are doing, if we can make a difference, if we can save one person from going to prison by learning what hate can do, because hate is a virus. Hate not only destroys those that you hate, but hate will destroy you eventually. So this is what we are trying to do. As Holocaust survivors, we have undertaken a mission. And our mission is to help America and the world to be a better place in the future.